The emphasis is not on how good something is. The emphasis is simply on the act of creating. So when you tell yourself, okay, I'm just going to get a script out. I'm just going to get the podcast out. I'm just going to get this chapter out. I'm just going to get this song out. Whatever it is, you're not aiming for perfection. You are simply saying, I do my job today if I put words down on the paper. Mm, we're live. How the Simpsons was written. The billion dollar writing insight. So today I came across an article in the New Yorker and this article detailed John Swartzwelder. He was a writer for the Simpsons. He wrote over 59 episodes. He is considered one of the greatest comedy minds of all time. If you make a good joke, it is called Swartzweldian. And The Simpsons has grossed, or, or The Simpsons rather, is worth somewhere around $12 billion, reportedly. So this guy knows what he's doing. John Swartzwelder, he wrote over 59 episodes of The Simpsons. The show has grossed over $12 billion. And he's written more episodes. He's been on more episodes than any other writer for The Simpsons. And this guy, John Swartzwelder, he notoriously does not do interviews. He's not public. He doesn't appear on camera. And so The New Yorker did an in-depth interview with him, a written article. I'll link that in the podcast description if you guys want to check out the whole thing. And he detailed a lot of great writing and creative insights that are super useful no matter what you do, whether it's writing or podcasting or music, anything that you do creatively, you can use these insights to your advantage. And so I want to go through a few of these insights today. And I just want to point out that I have my flaming mo cup with some ice and some whiskey as we embark on this journey together. So cheers. One of the first things that uh, John says about the actual writing process of the script, and I'm going to go through it word for word. This is a quote from the New Yorker article. He says, I always write my scripts all the way through as fast as I can. The first day, if possible, putting in crap jokes and pattern dialogue. Like Homer, I don't want you to do that. Then I won't do it. Then the next day I get up, the script's been written. It's lousy, but it's a script. The hard part is done. It's like crappy. It's like a crappy little elf has snuck into my office and had and, and badly done all the work for me and then left with the tip of his crappy hat. All I have to do from that point on is fix it. So I've taken a very hard job writing and turned it into an easy one, rewriting overnight. I advise all writers to do their script and other writing this way. And be sure to send me a small royalty every time you do it. So... That to me is a genius thing, a, a genius insight from a very a legendary writer, a great writer, someone who's super successful that has been at the top of his field. Writing a shitty first draft or doing something quick and shitty creatively for me, and I can talk about personal experience, releases a lot of the pressure of having to create something special because the emphasis is not on how can I make the best thing? The emphasis is not on how can I make something that's going to wow people? How can I make something that's going to be, you know, 10 million views? How can I make something that's going to change the game? The emphasis is not on how good something is. The emphasis is simply on the act of creating. So when you tell yourself, okay, I'm just going to get a script out. I'm just going to get the podcast out. I'm just going to get this chapter out. I'm just going to get this song out. Whatever it is, you're not aiming for perfection. You are simply saying, I do my job today. If I put words down on the paper, if I put notes in the song, whatever that may be. And so the act of doing something quickly and shittily, because the first draft is the shittiest draft. That's how it usually goes most of the time. Sometimes you get lucky and you're like, fuck, this is amazing. Most of the time that doesn't happen, <laughs> at least not for me. But you do get better. Your first drafts get better, so you're not always starting from ground zero. But set, like, for, for example, if you 
were struggling to write an article today, if you were struggling to write a chapter, article, poem, whatever it is, don't tell yourself, I have to have a finished product by the end of today, or I have to have a finished product by the end of this writing session. Instead, what may help you is to set a timer, set, put 30 minutes on a clock and say, by the end of this 30 minutes, I will write an article. I will write a poem. I will record a podcast. It won't be the best thing ever. There will be shitty parts of it but you will have done something. And so that gets you over the hump of creating. And then the next day you will have something to go through and there will be some tiny things there. There will be some things that you can expand on. There will be ideas there that you can blossom. There will be some shit like in that shit. And, and I've done it before. I've written and recorded a bunch of shit in that shit are specks of gold that you can use and and you and you and you foster and and you you know you raise them like your children and you grow them into something that is the final product which brings me to another point that writer's block isn't actually a thing when people say i have writer's block i can't write that unless you have a physical condition which is not allowing you to type on a keyboard or not allowing you to write a pen uh, write with a pen. Writer's block is not a thing. Wri writer's block is the unwillingness to write what comes to your mind. You can write your name down right now. You can write, I went for a walk with my dog and I bought a sandwich. That is not writer's block because you just wrote something down on a piece of paper. When people say writer's block and they're like, I can't write a thing, I can't write a thing. No, it's not that you can't write or you can't record. It's that you're unwilling to put the thoughts in your head down in the studio or down on paper. It's an unwillingness more than it is an inhibition. And so when you free yourself of the pressure to everything, that everything you have to make has to be perfection, everything you have to make has to be godly in some way, and you just put some shit on the paper, bam, you don't have writer's block anymore. You don't have creator's block because you are willing to put down shitty, subpar, okay ideas. And then the, those ideas turn into better, better ideas with the editing process and with putting in the reps over time. And so when I read that quote, I, I thought about writer's block and I was like, damn, like, I'm never going to have, I'm never going to have podcast block. Podcast block, as long as I can speak. I can record a podcast. I can say words and I can put a sentence together. I can say, I can turn on the, the microphone right in front of me and I can say, there is a light in my face and I'm in a room and I'm having a panic attack and I don't know what to say to record. And I'm looking at the New York City skyline and that looks like a great building to jump off of because I have no idea how to fucking do this. That's a podcast. I just recorded a podcast. It's not one that someone would listen to, but at least I said something. And you can do the same thing with writing. You can put something down and be willing to expose those ideas. So again, writer's block is a fucking mind game. It's not a, you can't write. It's that you just, you're not willing to put words down on a paper. You're not willing to type shit out. You're not willing to throw shit against the wall and see what works. It's, a, it's, it's, it's shrinking you, it's shrinking you creatively. There's another thing that John Swartzwelder said at the end of the article that I wanted to mention as well. So he says, this is a direct quote from The New Yorker, which again, I will link in the description. He says about uh, writing The Simpsons, the executives weren't sent advanced copies of the script and they couldn't attend read throughs, even though they very much wanted to. All we had to do was please ourselves. When people you know are in, let me rephrase that. Not when people you know. For public figures or for people with media platforms, when you know that they are in it to please themselves, as an audience member, as someone that consumes that person's content, that's, that helps you build a higher trust in that person because you aren't questioning, is this their thoughts? Is this what they honestly think of the situation? Is this what they honestly think of 
the president or is this what they honestly think of black lives matter is this is this what they honestly think of ice cream like whatever the fuck it is when someone has proven to you over time that they are making content because it is what they think and because it is fun for them and because it is pleasing to themselves it's what they genuinely genuinely think and like to fucking do that builds trust in you as an audience member. And it builds trust in me when I listen to people like Joe Rogan or Lex Friedman or Tim Dillon. I may not agree with everything they say, but I know that there's not some corporate media machine force feeding ideas down their throats with a, with a fucking tube and saying, say this shit, we're going to fire you. I know that whatever they're saying is true to them and, and they, it comes from within and they've cultivated things and they thought deeply about things and they don't have a fucking, you know, a, a machine vomiting ideas into their mouth that they have to spurt out on camera. And that, that I think is why uh, mainstream media like CNN, Fox are so untrustworthy because you can tell, you can see it in hosts' eyes when they're saying something and they're fucking like dead on the inside, but they they may be saying it enthusiastically, but in their eyes, their face, something gives it away where, you know, I don't believe what I'm saying right now. I don't give a fuck about what I'm saying right now. I don't believe it. I'm saying it enthusiastically and I'm saying it for a paycheck. And it's obvious there, I don't know exactly what it is. There's probably something you know, going on with body language or micro expressions, whatever. It's just like you can tell the difference. You feel it and you sense it in the people that are saying, you know, sometimes wild shit and believe it. And they're genuinely there. And they say, this is what I think. I know it's crazy, but like, I, I believe this and I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong, if, if it's not true. And then you have the people that get on mainstream media and, and TV, which is dying, by the way, no one's watching it. There are YouTube channels that are pulling in way more views than Fox and CNN on a nightly basis. And you see these guys and gals get up there and they say shit that they don't believe. And, and they, they're a corporate mouthpiece. And I think that comes down to pleasing yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, like on a, on a serious note, when... Uh, when John Swartzwelder, the writer of The Simpsons, talks about, you know, all we had to do is please ourselves, that's like the fucking magic sauce that attracts people and trusts audience. When you can tell that someone's having fun, when they're enjoying themselves, when they're, you know, pleasing themselves, fucking coming cocks all over their content, whatever you want to, uh, whatever sexual innuendos you want to throw in there. I appreciate that. I appreciate someone that's willing to do shit that they like to do. And whoever follows them, follows them. If you don't want to follow them, don't follow them. And that's fine. But what, what makes me disgusted and what makes me, what turns me off is when I can tell, I can sense something about people saying shit, whether it's on the news or, or just in casual conversation. I'm like, are you saying this? Like, do you actually believe this shit? Or are you just trying to signal to me that you're part of some group? Or are you trying to signal your wokeness in some way and you're spouting these things that when you break them down, don't even, there's nothing of substance there. You don't fucking, you haven't said anything to me, but you've said everything to me at the same time. I, I, I don't understand anything that you're saying, but I understand where you stand now because you're literally just spouting off shit to make people think you're woke or you're part of some group or you're better than everyone in some way. So that is my uh, TED Talk on wokeness. Again, go check out the New Yorker article. You can search. Let me uh, go to the top here so I can give you guys the, the title. It's called John Swartzwelder, Sage of the Simpsons on the New Yorker. I will link it in the bio. Those, again, are the two takeaways that I loved from that article. There are many. You'll probably get different things from it. I loved uh, the fact that John would write these quick, shitty drafts to get over the hump of creativity. And I loved that they were in it because they loved it. They were in it to please themselves. They weren't, you know, sending, sending the Simpsons script past executives. They were like, fuck it. If you like it, 
you like it. If you don't, you don't. We're throwing this shit out there. So thank you. Good night. Cheers. I hope you have a flaming mo, and I will talk to you guys next time.